Man, that is great. I never got to wear one of those uh, metal thingies. I think you had to earn them, and I just, you know, it was one of those things. I was really glad to get out of there, though. Congratulations to y'all, and it's very cool. So I'm going to address everyone, but uh, I'm going to address our seniors a little bit uh, directly as well. So this is not a sermon that's directed specifically to you, but I do want to share some things. Since I'm more than half your age, um, I think I can I, I can do that. I'm so I'm so my my eyes are very mature for their age, and so I'm at the point where I'm trying to figure out if I want bifocals or not. And uh, it's really great. So you'll get there eventually, Lord willing. Lord willing, you'll get there. If you live long enough, you deal with things like this. But I want to impart some wisdom on you this morning, not from me, but from from the Lord. We live in a society that is constantly bombarded with counsel and advice and do this and buy this and don't buy that and don't do this and all these things. And I just kind of want to scrub all that this morning and just hear from, from the Lord. So I want to give you a secret to life, a true secret to life. And if you follow this, regardless of your age here, regardless of you're, you're an adult or you're a senior and you're graduating, you're stepping into that adult, those adult roles, Regardless of what it is, if you will implement this, you will practice it for the rest of your life, even more so on a moment-by-moment basis over just a daily basis. If you will take this into consideration and put it into practice, you'll be able to look back on your life from this point forward and know that you fulfilled the very reason for your existence. You fulfilled the very reason for your existence. And I don't know about you, but that's pretty good. Uh, that's a pretty good advice to me. And this is something that has really jacked me up studying this to realizing how short I fall in this particular area. So here's a sermon in a sentence. The more we worship God alone, that's him and him alone, the more we worship God alone, the more faith, uh, excuse me, the more fulfilled our lives will become. So the more that we truly worship God and him alone, the more fulfilled our lives will become. And this is true, again, regardless of age, regardless of background, this is true and it can be true for you uh, for the rest of your life. It's an incredible, incredible thing. So worship is something that we automatically do. You are an amazing worshiper. You really are. Give yourself a hand. You're such a great worshiper. So great. You are because you worship with anything and everything that you do. So one of the basic, one of the basic definitions of worship is it's defined as expressing the worth. So worth-ship. It is, it's uh, expressing the worth or the value of something. So you are an amazing worshiper and you worship every day and every moment. You're always worshiping something, someone, an idea or an ideal And as humans, we live in a constantly engaged state of worship. It just simply depends on where our our worship is aimed. So you are worshiping on a regular basis, on a moment-by-moment basis, which is really scary, but let's dive into a broader definition of what worship really is. And again, we're talking about the heart of worship from the very core of of who you are. Here it is. Worship is is a state of heart that engages the mind, intellect, and body in such a way as to leave them no choice but to pursue what gives the purest praise, honor, and worth to the point of their affection. Now, Paul had big sentences, so don't give me a hard time. We had to get it all in. Let's read it one more time here. Worship is a state of heart that engages the mind, the intellect, and body in such a way as to leave them no choice but to pursue what gives the purest praise, honor, and worth to the point of their affection. True worship comes from the heart, from the very core of who you are. It comes from within. Sounds like a horror flick. It comes from within. But it does. That's where worship originates, and it comes from the heart. So, I'll give you, you you actually, another way to say it is we worship what we love. We worship what we love. You know, when I was 16, I had my first, no, just kidding. No beaver, no beaver. I'm trying to stay away from the songs today. But when I was 16, I really did have my first love, okay? And it was this amazing 
1976 puke green four-door Plymouth Valiant with a slant six in it. Yeah, come on. This car was the hottest car out there. Never. It never was. It was horrible. It was ugly. It was dog ugly. I mean, it was, it was bad. Um, to polish the car, you put as much polish as you can on it, but it never, it would never be shiny. It would never would be shiny because you would have the puke green matte finish paint. It just, it would not shine. But what was shiny were the seats. They were vinyl. I probably, I can't, I can't imagine the gallons of Armor All that I used in that thing. Y'all remember Armor All? Man. It smelled good. It looked good on the inside. Now, I will say this. It was a rookie mistake at 16, uh, experimenting with my first love and, and polishing her up and all of these things. The sheet, the, the, the uh, seats were shiny. The dash, dash was shiny. It had vinyl flooring in it. So I thought it would be a cool idea to clean that out and wash it out really good and to armor all the floor. Not good. Just saying, FYI, that was not a good plan. But when I was 16, my object, the very core of who I was, I was really obsessed with this car. We called it the frog. It's beautiful. <laughs> but I was obsessed with the frog because I got to do things with it. I got to go on different activities. It was an essential part of my life. We did a lot of bus ministry back then. The church I grew up with, they had buses. You'd go to different neighborhoods and pick up kids. You'd visit them again on Saturday and, you know, give them candy and stuff. And I know today that sounds like, you what? But back then it was, it was normal. And so it was really cool. And this car was an essential part. So you could say in part that I actually worshiped this car. Now, I wasn't bowing down to the car saying, oh, you wonderful frog, you. I just worship, I worship you. I worship. No, it wasn't that. But you worship what you love. The very core of who I was was wanting to be in that car, was wanting to go somewhere in that car. It was the focus of my attention and my affection. And in life, if you can make sure that your focus and attention is right, and it's on God, it's on glorifying God, and it's on honoring him, then you're going to save yourself so much trouble, a ton of trouble. But again, you're going to be able to look back on your life and say, I didn't waste it. I honored God with my life. I fulfilled the purpose of my existence. And so, I was basically interested in two different things at 16. I was gasoline and what do you think else? Perfume. That's right, girls. Girls, girls. No. So all kinds of stuff. Songs just go through. It's not my fault. It's not my fault, I promise. But um, I swear it's a condition. I just haven't labeled it yet. But that was it, was. it was gasoline and perfume. So gasoline and girls. And so one girl in particular, when I met her, she blew all the others out of the water. It was incredible. I started dating my wife. She didn't mind going out in the frog, so that worked out really well. And so uh, it was great. So I had, two, I had two loves in my life, right? And so what am I love? I mean, it's just, it's there. And it was awesome. And they became the focus of my attention. My attention was not on studying. My attention was not on God and godly things. It was on this beautiful girl. And this not so beautiful car. And what was interesting about that is I still struggle with some of that on a regular basis. And, and I'll, I'll just be very vulnerable. I struggle with worshiping my wife over God sometimes. A lot of times. A lot of times I put our relationship and I spend more time investing in my relationship with her. And my, I'm still infatuated with my wife. And I think about her more than I think about God I'm many days. And you may be saying, oh, that's so sweet. Oh, so loving. That's so nice. No, it's, it's sinful. Because I literally am struggling with praising and honoring God and thinking about him and glorifying him. Now, the perfect thing to do would be to marry those two and to be like, God, thank you so much for my wife. Thank you so much for this relationship, and I'm going to praise you and honor you. Then the priorities are in, are in line, and that's how it's supposed to be. But we worship what we love. Booze, sex, money, status, family, possessions like cars, gadgets, gizmos, the list goes on. We worship what we love, period. Whatever our priority is, that's what you love, and that's what you worship. 
And there's no way of getting around it. And you're like, well, that's not true for me. It is true for you. I want you for the next few minutes, so we dive into some scripture here. I want you to please open your mind, open your heart to the Holy Spirit. Ask him to speak to you. Ask God to change your heart in the areas that you might not even know need to be changed. Can we do that? All right, let's put our money where our mouth is. I'm going to bow my head, pray the same thing. Y'all do that in your seats. God, I pray you'll give a resounding yes to all these prayers going out to you. Holy Spirit, speak to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Worship is not merely, to focus back on here, so worship is not merely following a set of rules and guidelines. There must be heart behind it. The very core of who you are, if we're going to worship God, there has to be heart behind it. So whatever that priority is in your heart, in your mind, that is what the focus and the, point, uh, the, the focal point of your worship is going to be. So if that's wrong, it's really wrong. If it's right, then it's really right. So let's open up to Matthew chapter 12. We're going to read two different passages. Matthew, Matthew 12, we're going to start in verse 1. Uh, I read from the NLT instead of the NLT because I don't have to re-explain it. It's really good. If you want a good Bible that's accurate and that is easy to read, uh, the New Living Translation is phenomenal. So that's what's going to be on the screen. And if you have your apps or whatever like that, you can turn to that too. So starting in verse 1. The title to this says a discussion about the Sabbath, but what it really should say is Jesus jacks up the Pharisees. I mean, that's really what is happening here, and we'll figure out why in just a second. About that time, Jesus was walking through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, so they began breaking off some heads of grain and eating them, but some Pharisees saw them do it and protested. Look, your disciples are breaking the law by harvesting grain on the Sabbath. Jesus said to them, haven't you read in the scriptures what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He went into the house of God, and he and his companions broke the law by eating the sacred loaves of bread that only the priests were allowed to eat. And haven't you read in the law of Moses that the priest on duty in the temple may work on the Sabbath? I tell you, there's one here who is even greater than the temple. But you would not have condemned my innocent disciples if you knew the meaning of this scripture. He quotes Hosea. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. For the Son of Man is Lord even over the Sabbath. Now, turn over real quick to chapter 15, just a few pages away. We have the same thing happening. In verse 1, it says, Some Pharisees and teachers of religious law now arrive from Jerusalem to see Jesus. They asked him, Why do your disciples disobey our age-old tradition? For they ignore our tradition of ceremonially washing their hands before they eat. Jesus replied, And why do you, by your tradition, violate the direct commandments of God? For instance, God says, Honor your father and mother, and anyone who speaks disrespectfully of father or mother must be put to death. But you say it's all right for people to say to their parents, Sorry, I can't help you for what I vowed to give to God. Uh, I vowed to give to God what I would have given to you. In this way, you say they don't need to honor their parents. And so you cancel the word of God for the sake of your own tradition. You hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you, for he wrote, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship is a farce, for they teach man-made ideas as commands from God. Jesus was typically livid with the Pharisees because of this. They were all about the outside actions. They were all about the, keeping the rules as their worship. So what you do, the things that you do, how you feel, how your mind is, what you focus on, that is worship. A lot of times we think that just coming, we come to gather here as a church, and we're, what do we say? We're going to worship, right? Or we're going to church. We're going to worship, you know, all these things. But worship is something that you do every day. It's like the air that you breathe. This is the air I breathe. You remember that one? So that was a really hot song when it came out. But it's just like breathing. You are going to focus and you are going to worship on something. 
But what Jesus was constantly saying to the Pharisees, it was hardly an encouraging word. What he would typically say to the Pharisees is, you're getting it wrong. Look at the heart of the scripture. Look at the heart of the matter. What is the meaning behind this? What precedence is it supposed to uh, make? Jesus was always getting the Pharisees to look beyond their own man-made traditions and even the law of God as it was written, the rules and regulations they were supposed to follow as Israel to say, look at the heart of it. You're not supposed to eat the breads that were just there for the, uh, for the, uh, the priests. Not supposed to eat those. But Jesus is like, look, it's, it's bread. David and his men were starving. Was it wrong for them not to starve to death? Even the priest has to work on the Sabbath. And there's a provision for that. So Jesus was always talking about getting to the reason why. Why, 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 why? It's not about the rules. It's about the heart. Everything flows from the heart. If the heart is wicked, then the thoughts and actions of that person are going to be wicked. If the heart is aiming towards pleasing and honoring God, then your actions are going to follow. Whatever is in your heart, whatever you're focused on, that core of who you are that engages your mind, you are going to act on it. Some one of the old theologians used to say, um, and R.C. Sproul actually talked about this uh, as well, is you are you always bend to your strongest will, always. If somebody comes up to you and they put a gun to your head and they say, give me your wallet, what are you going to do? <laughs> yeah, there is some self-defense things. You only have two choices, though. Come on, so, Michael. But yeah, two choices. You're going to give them the wallet, right? Why? Because your will to live is stronger than your will to die. You always bend to your strongest will in the same way you will always worship what you love and what is the largest priority in your life. The result of performing an act on the outside like the Pharisees isn't worship. So going through the motions, doing good things is not worship. Coming here because we're gathering together as a church is not worship. As a matter of fact, many times it leads to hypocrisy, and it is hypocrisy if your heart isn't in it. It's, it's, it's an incredible, heavy truth, but we do this all the time, right? We come to, we come to let's just say, come to church. We come to church, we gather together, we, and that's a good thing. We give money to the church, that's a good thing. We give money to charity. That's a good thing. We give time to the church, charity, all kinds of other things. Um, we celebrate different traditions. All those are wonderful things. We're nice to people. We're kind to people. Even people that are not kind to us, we're kind to them. Man, that should be really high on the list of really cool and great things to do. But if your heart isn't behind it and it's just an act, it's just the motions that you're going through, it's hypocrisy. And unfortunately, it's, it's prevalent. And, and again, I've talked about my past in a, uh, several times. I'll talk about it again. But I was raised in a very conservative church, very conservative church, and I learned how to do the right things. I learned how to say the right things to the right people. I learned how to act the right way. I learned how to turn this music down when this person was around. Um, you know, you couldn't listen to rock and roll, but you could listen to 50s. That was different. I don't know why. You couldn't listen to country, but you could listen to gospel music that sounded like country, but the singers were not up to par with, you know, Willie Nelson or anybody like that. I mean, it was all these rules and regulations. So you learn how to skirt around the truth. You learn how to do the right things around the right people to get the right kind of response. But guess what? Your heart gets left in the dust. Why? Because it's just empty. Works without relationships is, is just empty religious acts. And that's what Jesus was coming down on the Pharisees about time and time again, over and over. But we can't point the finger because many times we're doing the exact same thing. Like the Pharisees, we can become so distracted in doing good things that we miss the fact that our heart isn't in it. And just going through the motions again ends up being hypocrisy. And a lot of times we don't, we don't, we miss it because everybody's patting us on the back. Oh, you did such a great job. Oh, you're doing great. Oh, you're volunteering to help people with a tornado. 
oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. And so what happens is you get the affirmation from people and you start feeling better about yourself and you mistake the fact that you are feeling better about yourself as a result of man, not a result of God. Saying, God, I am right with you, so I feel good. I'm at peace and I'm at, I have joy because of you, not because I'm doing the right things. It's all about the heart. Jesus says, I desire mercy. I desire compassion over sacrifice. And so Matthew 15, 8 and 9 says this. It says, these people, Jesus talking, nobody beats the riz, so we're going to pay attention to this one. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. Again, we're asking God to speak to our hearts. You think we fall into that category? I think the honest answer would be sometimes. I know sometimes I do. Sometimes my selfishness gets in the way and I miss the fact that I've tasted and I've seen that the Lord is good and he's worth serving and everything in my being wants to be right with him. I miss that sometimes. So I think the honest answer would be sometimes, but how different would the decisions that we make on a regular basis? Again, this is one of the secrets to life. How different would the decisions that we make on a, on a regular basis be uh, if we were determined to ask ourselves if what we were about to do could be done as an act of worship to God? And I will direct that to those of you who are leaving home or going off to college. Uh, maybe you're moving out. Maybe you're getting married. I don't know. What, whatever God has for you. But in this next stage of life, you will save yourself so much pain if you will ask yourself those questions. Is this what I'm about to do? Is this honoring to God? Is what I am about to do, can I do this as an act of worship to God and say, God, I'm going to worship you with this? And it may be something controversial. I saw a t-shirt the other day that I did not purchase, but I did think about purchasing it. I had Charles Haddon Spurgeon, one of the great, great, great theologians of, of old. He's been dead for a long time. And so, but uh, his writings live and I had Spurgeon's head on the shirt and he was smoking a cigar and it says, before the evening is finished, I will smoke a cigar for the glory of God. And I was like, man, I like that. I like that shirt and the attitude. But it's the whole concept of is what you are doing, is what you're going to do this evening, honoring to God, glorifying to him. Is it something that you can offer to him as an act of worship? meditating from your heart, from the core, and engaging your mind to say, God, this is for you, and I'm doing this for you. Another way that we could say this is, can I, God, can I post this photo as an act of worship to you? Is this TikTok? Is this TikTok going to draw others closer to you? Is this Instagram post going to give me greater joy and peace from you because you will enjoy it? And you'll see it as an act of worship. Um, are the clothes I'm wearing, do they show that I love you? Does the way that I treat people that don't look or act like me show people that I'm worshiping you? Are the thoughts that I'm thinking about myself causing me to praise and worship you for making me how and who I am? See, if our heart isn't worshiping the Lord Jesus, nothing we do will ever satisfy us. Our hearts must be engaged in honoring and glorifying God. That's that heart of worship, to worship him, to show him that he is worth serving and honoring and glorifying and praising. And it's incredible. And again, this is something that I struggle with on a, on a regular basis. When it talks about that self-talk, does it honor God when you talk about yourself, the way that you think about yourself? I struggle with that. I wrote in a journal, which I don't like journaling. Not really good at it. It's the whole writing thing. Yeah. Um, I'm not really great at journaling, but I started to do it, and I've got some. I actually ordered to 
two uh, journals that came in the mail the other day. This is one of them. I like writing. I'm kind of falling in love with putting my thoughts down on paper. And I went off for a little personal retreat last weekend just to be alone with God and prep for this sermon. And one of the things that he had me do was write down my personal sins. And instead of saying, I struggle with pride, I said, I am prideful. Instead of saying, I struggle with being content, I said, I struggle with being greedy, you know, or whatever the case is. And then I started praying, but writing down those prayers. Have you ever done that? It's extremely good. Jordan Peterson talks about that a lot. If you can, if you can write and you can speak and communicate, then you are nearly unstoppable. And so get used to writing. I'm getting back into it. And one of the things, the thoughts that came out because I was writing them down was I can help countless men ask God for forgiveness and to move on in their life and, ex- and accept his grace. But I refuse to do that for myself. That was real from my heart. And God used that to start me forgiving myself and giving me the same grace that I would give someone else. And he started changing me in that moment of personal worship. What I was doing that was so bad, you say, well, what's bad about that? You should give yourself a hard time. That motivates you to get better. Well, in some cases it does. But what I was doing was criticizing the very grace that God was giving me. I was saying, God, your grace is not enough. God, your mercy is not enough. It applies to everyone else, but not me. And that's a lifelong struggle, but it's getting better. And it's been amazing. Part of that is because I'm worshiping, I'm trying to center in on continually worshiping God, not Tim. So why do we have such problems with this? And we're going to sum up here in just a minute. Question you could ask yourself, students, is instead of using the long version of, you know, what am I, you know, is this, is this can I use this as an offering to God, as a praise or whatever like that? Just ask yourself, who am I worshiping right now? Who or what am I worshiping right now in this very moment? What is it? Ask yourself those questions. Do it periodically. Do it often. Maybe journal it. Write it down. I'm worshiping this, I'm worshiping that. And then one day, you'll be like, oh, I'm asking myself this, this same question, and I'm writing down, I'm worshiping God in this moment because he is so amazing, and he is great. And this, and this, and this. But the bigger question is, what is keeping us, what is keeping you from worshiping God and following him in the first place? And the reason is you have an evil, disgusting, vile thing living within you. Paul calls it the flesh. For believers, you're free from the flesh. You do not have to submit to the flesh. You should not be producing the works of the flesh. According to Galatians 5, we should be walking in the spirit. If we're walking in the spirit, then we're producing the works, uh, uh, excuse me, the fruit of the spirit. If we're not, then we're producing the works of the flesh, and those are going to kill us. Those are what tear our lives apart. That's what breaks us down. But we still, it's, it's a battle right? It is a battle. Paul said it was such a big battle. He said, the things that I want to do, I don't. And the things that I don't want to do, I end up doing. Oh, wretched man am I. Who can free me? Who could possibly rescue me? He said, only Jesus, only Jesus Christ. You have the flesh in you. Paul said that you have to kill it daily. It is a daily deal. Until we pass on, we have to keep keep pressing on and fighting the flesh every day. That's the big question. So what if you've been, what if you find yourself in the position where you're like, you know what, I don't have, I have a heart of worship. I worship really good, but I'm not worshiping God. What if you have found yourself sitting here this morning, God's speaking to you and he's revealing that you're just going through the motions. It takes a lot of guts to be able to admit that. It takes a lot of boldness to say, I'm struggling. My heart, I'm here at Southcrest with all these amazing, beautiful 
people. And I'm singing the songs. And I'm looking good and I'm smelling good. But it doesn't glorify God. It's not, it, has, it doesn't have anything to do with God. This is just a comfortable place for me to be. Well, number one, we're glad you're here. But I don't want you to change your habit. I don't want you to change your heart today. I want you to change it now, immediately. Start recognizing, God, I'm going through the motions. But my heart is far from you. Many times we come to church because we feel like it's checking a box. We go to small group because it's checking a box. We give money. We do all this stuff because we feel like it's giving us that affirmation that we talked about earlier. And then we live that way in front of people and we live like hell away from people when nobody's watching. Can I be, be that blunt? It's a fact. If that's you, stop. Cry out to God. Ask him to forgive you of those sins. Ask him to change your heart. Ask him to change the very core of who you are, to change your mind, to have a deeper desire to please him and to honor him and to glorify him. If we're going to have a heart of worship that honors God and praises him and makes an impact on this world as a church body, as a community, as a state, as a nation and beyond, we must start with getting the hypocrisy out of our lives and saying, God, I don't want to be like this. I don't want to be a casual Christian. I don't want to be another statistic. I want to truly do something with you. I want to worship you in spirit and in truth, and I want to make an impact on this world in a real, super honest, raw, and genuine way. Forget about it. I'm not going to be fake anymore. Life is too short to be fake. Help me move forward and honor and glorify you. You may be in the position tonight that you need to do that if, that, if that's you and you fall into that category. And you're like, you know what? I don't, even, I, don't even know if I'm a, I don't even know if I'm a believer. I don't even know if I'm a follower of Christ because I've been doing this. Let me tell you something. I think I was truly saved as an adult, but I prayed a magic prayer when I was a kid. I got wet in the baptismal, dunked under, back up. Man, it was great. Oh, there's little Timmy. Oh, good job, little Timmy. He's following Jesus. No. I had a basic understanding. My heart was still far from God. But I grew up thinking that I was saved because I was doing the right things, just like the Pharisees. On the outside, they were pleasing to God in their eyes only. And that's the way I was until God finally woke me up one day. My life has never been the same. You may be in that position. As an elder... Southcrest Church, it is my duty to do everything that I can to help you live a genuine Christian life, to honor and to glorify God with your life. The Old Westminster Catechism says, the very first question and answer in there, it says, what is the chief end of man? And the response to the answer is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. It's not just to glorify God, but that enjoying means that you are engaging your heart, your mind, your feelings, everything. Church, don't be, don't be fake. Don't give empty praise. Have that heart of worship. I'll end with the illustration. Dr. William Bates, not Norman, but William. Dr. William Bates. It's one of the doctors, he's an old ophthalmologist. And uh, he does something, and check with your doctor on this. Uh, uh, do your research. I'm not endorsing this, but he did something that was actually, uh, the reports that I read that were about his things said that it helped with macular de degeneration, it's helped with cataracts, all this other stuff. This stuff was written 100 years ago, keep in mind. But the principle is the same, and I've actually practiced it quite a bit myself. My vision is actually getting better as a result of some of this. And it may be placebo, and I'm okay with that as long as my vision gets better and I feel good about it, right? Give me a sugar pill. I don't care. But it's called sunning. It's sunning and palming. And with the sunning, basically you go outside and you close your eyes. And Dr. Baird explained, you look at the sun. And typically it's morning or evening sun. You close your eyes. You look at the sun with your eyes closed. <laughs> it's very important. And you... And you basically move your head back and forth like this. 
while looking into the sun with your eyes closed and the warmth of the sun penetrates your eyelids and goes in and does all kinds of things. And you just, you do it for three to five minutes. And all of a sudden, after a minute or two, you feel your neck starting to relax. You start really feeling your eyes relax. And ultimately, I think that's what some of the reports showed is it was, it's a relaxing method that helps helps you with your vision. After you do that for three to five minutes, you do what he calls palming, and that's taking your palms, putting them over your eyes, and basically doing the same thing. Just relaxing the neck and you're relaxing your eyes, except this time your eyes are open. And what you find once you open your eyes to normal light is you have better night vision. You can't see in the dark, but you have better night vision. Uh, things actually seem to be more vibrant, clearer. They have a, t- a tighter focus. And everything is definitely a little more vibrant. If you're struggling with this hypocrisy in your life, I would give you the same advice. With better studies and better research and something that you can hang your hat on that you don't have to check with anybody about is that that same thing is true in worship. When you find yourself choosing, making, making poor decisions, when you find yourself worshiping a relationship with a guy or a girl as opposed to worshiping God, when you find that you're so distracted with all these other things in life, stop what you're doing and look to the sun. S-O-N, look to Jesus. Take some time to stop and focus on him. Cry out like David, search me, O God, and know my heart. See if there be any wicked way in me and lead me on your path of everlasting. Help me worship you and you alone again. Help me focus on you. The overall vision of our lives will change. Our circumstances might not change, but because we're choosing to worship God and we're looking to the sun, the vision of our heart, our focus is going to be in the right direction. And if our focus is right, everything else is gonna change because our heart is going to follow. When the heart is right, everything falls into place. So worship It's a state of heart. It's focused on God. Godly worship is a state of heart that engages the mind, the intellect, and body in such a way as to leave them no choice but to pursue what gives the purest praise, honor, and worth to the point of their affection. My prayer is that you're worshiping the Son of God, the living, the risen Jesus with all of your heart, your mind, your soul, your spirit, and your strength. And if not, again, don't start doing that today. Start doing it now. We're not promised the rest of today. Please don't leave here without at least asking God to make sense of all of this and to help you have a heart of worshiping Him, following Him, honoring and glorifying him.